welcome to our fourth podcast of Unit 1. I am at the top of page um, 7. Actually, I guess we're not really at the top. We're about halfway down because today in class you should have um, gone through the first half looking at those intensive, extensive properties. Notice those are a physical property. Physical property meaning they are describing just how a object looks, feels, what it can do, it can boil, it can melt. They're talking physical descriptions. Um, a very common physical property we talk about is if it's a solid, liquid, or gas. So a solid, um, definite shape, definite volume. So if I'm drawing pictures of what a solid looks like, so if I'm drawing what these molecules look like, I'm drawing the molecules themselves really, really close together. Okay, here's my box, I'm having problems with this pen, there we go. The particles are stacked really, really close together. They're just vibrating, they're not moving very much. Versus if I have a liquid, those particles are a little bit further apart. They hold their shape, so there's still attraction, but they're going to flow, they're going to take the shape of the container. If I have a gas, indefinite shape, indefinite fall volume, those gas particles are all over the place. They're random, no order. They're very, very, very far apart. It's the only difference when you take a solid liquid gas is where the particle are in relationship. Okay, gas, what do we call it? Yep, we call it vapor. So just know if we talk about something saying it's in the vapor phase, it's also in the gas phase. Um, one that I want you to add is aqueous. We, in a few weeks, when we really start talking about some reactions or some solutions, does it dissolve? Aqueous is different. It's going to make a solid dissolved in water. So what we're going to realize, you can start looking at some different things. If I say sodium chloride, solid, these are state symbols. Solid, liquid, gas, AQ, aqueous. This means you have table salt. NaCl, you've really heated it, and you say it's a liquid, you've melted it. NaCl is a gas, you've really, really heated it to make it become a vapor. NaCl aqueous, you have salt water. So just some ways we're going to be communicating this year. So look at the bottom. I said draw a model of what the particles would look like in each state. I would kind of go back up and look at what I drew and use that as an example. And we want you to actually draw a model of what those would look like. Okay, page 8. So hopefully you've paused, you've done that. You're going to go back and do it. Don't forget, we check for that. Um, we will also talk about plasma. No, we won't talk about plasma. Some of you might have said, wait, what about plasma? It's very, very high energy. It's when the electrons actually are getting stripped. You know what? That's lightning. We don't really know how to control lightning, so we won't be talking about plasma in chemistry. That's your lightning. That's your wake-up call. Okay, so physical properties were we talking about yesterday. We looked at some temperature, volume, mass. Now let's look at some chemical properties. Um, so, when I have chemical property, a chemical property is talking about how it can change and it's going to change into something new. So, difference physical is just kind of a physical description about it. Chemical is talking about how it can change. Um, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. That is a physical property. Hydrogen reacts with oxygen to make water is a chemical property of water. Sodium is a soft, malleable metal at room temperature. That is a physical property. Sodium reacts with water, producing sodium hydroxide is a chemical property. So if it's talking about how it reacts, iron reacts with air to form rust, chemical property of rust, of iron, excuse me. Okay, well, let's talk about how some things can change. So the difference, a physical change then is talking just about how it's going to change the substance shape, 
Um, that's the number one thing. Sometimes you can change states. If I go from a solid to a liquid, if I melt water, it's still water. Solid water, liquid water, still H2O, physical changes. So important thing, it doesn't change the composition of it. Chemical change, and other, um, on the other hand, talks about it changing into a new substance. That's when you have chemical reactions. Again, iron reacting with the oxygen, making iron oxide, rust. That's talking about a chemical change. I can't get that iron back. It's changed into something new. Water melts and becomes a liquid. I can refreeze it and get the ice back. That's a physical change. I haven't changed the composition. What you kind of ask yourself, huh, is it a physical change or is it a chemical change? Can I get that substance back to its form or has it changed into something new? Let me tell you, a really hard one you get caught up on is dissolving. Dissolving substances. Is that a physical or a chemical? So if you look, you have A, B, C, D. So let's look, breaking a pencil. If you just break a pencil, it's still a pencil. Yes, yeah, so that's a physical change. Water freezing, forming ice, it's still water. That is physical. But if I fry an egg, can I get that egg back to a raw state? No, it's changed in something new. It's a chemical change. You finish D, E, and, um, well, there's two E's. I do know my alphabet, so you finish D, E, and E, otherwise known as F. We'll talk about those tomorrow in the beginning of the class. Um, add this. What are some signs that you know a chemical change has happened? So I would add up there by the chemical change to the side. If you see bubbles producing, now this isn't that I'm putting water and boiling it, it's you put mix two things together and you form bubbles, you means you made a gas. A precipitate, that means a solid, know that word. This is a very, very important word we'll be using a lot. You need to know precipitate means a solid. Precipitate means a solid. Heat released. Light, you see bright light, that means an energy is being released. You see a change in color. Think about the leaves on a tree. They turn to an orange color. They might, the tree might grow new leaves, but that orange leaf will not turn back into green. That's a chemical change. So ask yourself, can I reverse it? Um, conservation of mass, that's what it sounds like. It's conserved, we don't create a mass nor destroy it in a reaction. It is conserved. So when we start balancing equations, this is what we need to know. Okay, here's my example. So if I have, you don't have to write all this, but look at this. If I have 216 grams of mercury, it's heated, decomposed, what's the mass of the oxygen released? Okay, so look at this is what I need to know. If I notice here, mass before equals mass after. So if I had 216 grams before, if I had 200 grams, I know that this amount has to equal the before amount. So therefore, that's how I know 16 grams of oxygen was produced. We can use this to identify unknowns just because we know that mass is conserved. Okay, some vocab here. Vocab that should be probably in middle school, but we're definitely going to be going some new, some old. Okay, pure substance. It's a pure substance if it cannot be broken down by ordinary chemical means. If you cannot be broken down by ordinary, ordinary chemical means, we classify it as a pure substance. An element then is one of those pure substance. We can't separate it. You can, if I split an atom, but that's not ordinary physical means. Okay, a compound, two or more elements that combine chemically, sodium chloride. I can't break it apart. I can chemically separate it, but not physically. So key word, you're saying physical separation. Okay, so then at the top of page nine, well, what's a mixture then? So we have two categories of, math, of matter, pure substances, then we have mixtures. So a mixture then is a combination of two or more pure substance where, look what happens, they retain their individual properties. These are ones you can separate physically. And my tablet was written sideways, sorry, so I was kind of writing on the side. 
you can physically separate it. Big difference. Okay, heterogeneous. Heterogeneous, they are not evenly blended. Pepperoni pizza, a salad, um, muddy water. If you can see the different parts, then you know it's heterogeneous. Homogeneous are even, they're continuous. They are a single phase um, solutions right here. This is a key word. So if I have sugar water solution, salt water solution, anytime you see the word solution, they are homogeneous. Soda, Coca-Cola, pop, as I call it, um, homogeneous. Sweet tea, most sweet teas, um, they are homogeneous, they're uniform. Air, air is a mixture. Air is a homogeneous mixture. If there's nitrogen, there's oxygen, then we have some helium, and there's some hydrogen. We have smaller components of it, but the major component of air is nitrogen. So a solution down here, well, what is a solution? A solution is just a homogeneous mixture. You can have liquid, you can have solutions in the liquid phase, in the gas phase, or in the solid phase. So kind of reflect on what is the difference between a heterogeneous and homogeneous and give some examples. That's again, we'll be talking about those tomorrow in class. We want you thinking about those. Um, metal mixtures, solid mixtures, alloys. An alloy is a mixture of a metal and another element. They are made to make that metal to increase its properties, to enhance it, to make it stronger, more durable. So here are some samples that you've probably, you've all seen them. Brass, bronze, um, stainless steel, jewelry. The silver that you wear is not pure silver, it's a mixture. Um, gold is not pure, it's also a mixture, because uh, your gold jewelry, because they need to make it stronger. So these are your types of mixtures. Okay, how do we separate a mixture then? These are the most common. Um, we'll talk about ones that you will actually see. And we'll add some um, to definitions, examples. Decantation, this is you literally just the pour the liquid off a solid. You separate it out. You have some muddy water. You let it settle. You pour the water, leaving the sand. You're decanting it. That fancy way of just saying you're pouring it off. Distillation, chromatography, and filtration we'll talk about a little bit more and a little bit of examples of them. So distillation, write it down. What do you use for dis distillation? What do you need to know? Boiling points. You separate them by different boiling points. So if you notice they boil it, and then this is if you have a mixture of liquids that boil at different temperatures. Different temperatures, excuse me, they're going to boil it off and then they condense it. This is cold water and so then they're going to collect this other liquid over here. So through distillation you can separate liquids but with different boiling points. Filtration. Filtration is you have a funnel and some kind of a filter paper and so a filtration is used to separate solids from liquids. So you use this to separate solids and liquids. And it does it better than just decanting because it's when we really want to separate it then we can dry off the solid and we'll know how much we had. You will be doing the, cell, the filtering in our next lab. This is what we're going to be using to separate our mixture. And then we have chromatography. Um, chromatography, what happens is it's the difference with the attraction of particles. So don't write this entire paragraph. Just notice the difference in the attraction of particles. There's different types. We'll come back and kind of look at that. But you really, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on chromatography. We'll talk more about that in AP Chemistry. This shows you the difference that it, this color, is just a um, blot of ink, separates into all the different components based on its polarity. So when we talk about polarity, we'll come back and talk about chromatography a little bit more. Okay, so I'm just fi finish up here on page 10. Um, 
there are 90 naturally occurring elements. Elements 1 through 92, but if you notice, two little sneak their way in, man-made sneak their way in, um, are man-made. So everything after uranium, um, excuse me, 1 through 92 are not man-made. They are naturally occurring. Everything after uranium is man-made. And that's, again, when you look at the periodic tables on our walls, remember, the white means it is man-made. Um, so the last thing, there's that question, how are they um, similar? How are they um, different? These questions and things, we're going to be doing a big discussion tomorrow. So these are some leading questions and some questions we want you to be thinking about and being prepared to have some discussion. So that's the reason we've kind of put these um, throughout the lecture. We want you thinking about these and be ready coming in to discuss them tomorrow. Last thing is how do we separate and classify matter? So here's a flow chart kind of showing some questions to ask. So first thing, variable composition. Is it uniform? Um, what else I would put here? Can it be physically separated? Meaning physically using filtration, using those, dis if I could use any of those four methods to separate it, you have a mixture. So if you say yes, it's a mixture. If no, it's a pure substance. And then can it be separated into simpler substances? So pure substance, this is by chemical means. So if I can chemically separate it, that's how I knew I had a compound. That was a mix, that was a physical, excuse me, a chemical combination of two or more elements. If I can't chemically separate it down, then I have an element. And notice again the molecules. Look at the pictures. Okay, over on the mixtures, is it uniform? If it's uniform, you have a homogeneous. There's our sweet tea, a tea with sugar. It's a solution. Is it heterogeneous? That means it's not uniform. So if you look at wet sand, you can see the two distinct layers and see the differences between it. We will see you tomorrow. Come ready to do some, have some discussions about all the different properties of matter.